being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. My name is Buster Beaker, and welcome to Cooking with Science. Let's say, for example, I've spilled the salt. Oh, no. Look at me. I've spilled the salt. Oh, there's salt all over the place. Not really a big deal, right? All you have to do is clean up the salt, put it back in the container. But, oh, no, I've also spilled pepper on the salt. But that's all right. You might be able to carefully separate the set. But, no, oh, dear, look, the pepper and the salt are all mixed together. What do I do? Well, here's how you can save the day using the power of science. All you need is a cloth and a plastic spoon, like, like this one here. Just rub the plastic spoon on a cloth and you'll be charging it up with a negative charge of static electricity. If it's got a negative charge, it will attract anything that has a neutral charge, just like the salt and pepper. But I know what you're thinking. How will we separate them? Well, here's the answer, my friends. Pepper is lighter than salt. Observe. Well, if you hold the spoon high enough, the pepper will be attracted and make the jump up to the bottom of the spoon, but not the salt, as long as you've got it high enough up. Because the salt is heavier, you'd have to bring the spoon closer, which we're not going to do. And if you tap it off to the side, you'll make a nice little pile of pepper, and there you go, separating pepper from salt using the power of science. <laughs> Thanks for watching Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Ah. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. Whenever friends come over, I like to make my famous potato chip recipe. And look at this bag of potato chips. Quite large, there must be a lot of potato chips in here, right? Well, let's open it. What? This potato chip bag is mostly air. Why do potato chip bags have so much air? Well, to tell you the answer to that, I have to tell you the story of two bags of potato chips. Here they are. This one full of air. And this bag of potato chips, there's not much air in it at all. Why don't they make them like this? Well, let's find out. First thing that happens is the potato chip bags come off the conveyor belt at the potato chip factory where they get packed into a crate. Here's a crate here. So let's really stuff them in. And then the crate gets boxed up and shipped off to the store. Oh, it's a bumpy ride to the store today. Now we're at the store. And then you come along. Ah, bags of potato chips. What else should I buy today? Oh, I know. How about a cantaloupe? Very nice. Some apples, yes? And take it home, walk along, and you get to the kitchen. You have a choice. This bag of potato chips, where all the potato chips are light and fluffy, or this bag of potato chips, which is not exciting at all. And that's why potato chip bags have so much air, to protect the potato chips from getting crushed. Speaking of potato chips, time to get back to my recipe. What is it? It's potato chip soup. Well, hi, Master Beaker, and thanks for joining me on Cooking with Science. Perhaps a little bit more cooking. <laughs> Being a chef is my absolute passion, and cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Strange. The spoon is no sharper than it was before. <laughs> oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker, and today we're cooking with coal. Today, we're going to learn how to make a drink cool. Look at this bottle of lemonade. It's warm right now and not very refreshing. So, what's the best way to cool this down? We put it in ice, right? But did you know there's an even better recipe than ice? You can make ice colder. It's true. All you need to do is add salt. I've got a second bowl of ice and a second jug of lemonade, and I've got two digital thermometers. What I'm going to do is add salt to this bowl. 
What the salt does is starts to melt the ice, and that actually consumes heat. This is called an endothermic reaction, and it absorbs heat, which makes the ice colder. And as you can see, this bowl of ice still sitting at around zero degrees Celsius, but this bowl, minus eight and falling. Wow. So there you have it, making something even colder than ice would normally make it. That is a way to make a refreshing glass of lemonade. I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on Cooking with Science. Oh. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. My tuna fish and meatball sub soup is coming along quite nicely. But what will we have for dessert? I know. How about earthquake buildings? Ha <laughs> ha! It's a building made out of wafer cookies. But the people on Vanilla Street built in the gelatin neighborhood. And the people on Chocolate Street built in the crispy rice part of town. Exciting. Now, here comes the earthquake. Oh, no! Oh, it's shaking! Oh! The shaking has come and gone for the people on Chocolate Avenue, and their building is still standing. Now, let's take a look over here on Vanilla Street, and here comes an earthquake. Oh, no! Dear, looks like the people on Vanilla Street are going to have to rebuild their building because it's all fallen over and being eaten. <laughs> mm, delicious. Buildings can be built the same way, but the kind of soil they sit on make a large difference if there's an earthquake. Shaky, wiggly soil or solid, non-moving soil. So there you go. An experiment you can try at home. Delicious. Well, I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on this episode of Cooking with Science. Mm, now to try my soup. Being a chef is my absolute passion, and cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. <laughs> Delicious. Nothing is more important to have fresh than your seafood. It's what makes the difference between a fresh fish... <laughs> ah, ...and one that isn't so fresh. <laughs> <coughs> if you live by the ocean, you probably know that the water gets high tide and low tide. Look closely, it's the same location. Amazing! Oh. But did you know that this is caused by the gravity of the moon and the sun? <laughs> Say this cookie is the Earth. And this little happy fellow is me. Hello! <coughs> and this string represents the water around the Earth. If we didn't have gravity to worry about, the water would all be equally deep around the Earth. But here comes the moon, this mushroom. Now, the moon has gravity, and that pulls the oceans towards it a little bit, like this. And that creates high tide there, and low tide here, and a little bump of high tide on the other side of the Earth. And as the Earth rotates and I'm on it, I experience low tide and high tide, and low tide and high tide. Very interesting. But there's another factor. The sun, or this lemon. Now, the sun also affects the tides, but not as much as the moon. Now, the sun does not affect the tides as much as the moon because it's much further away, but it still has an effect. If the sun was here, then the tides would be pulled away a little bit like that, and the tides would be less severe. But if the moon and the sun line up, like over here, you'd get a very, very high tide and very, very low tide. So there you are. That's how the tides are affected by the gravity of the moon and the sun. Mmm, delicious. I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on Cooking with Science. Oh. <laughs> yeah! My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. <laughs>